So good morning, Spring Lake Village. I'm thrilled to be with you once again um, as we begin the month of May. So um, as you know, I had hoped to um, be with you in person at Spring Lake this month, but unfortunately, uh, Sutter Health, where I was scheduled to uh, receive my um, second dose of the virus uh, last month, kind of screwed up. And um, now I'm scheduled to get the uh, second dosage um, in about a week and a half or so. But that'll mean that I won't be able to um, meet you in person until the first week uh, in June. So um, this month's lecture will once again be virtual, but it's an enjoyable one um, in celebration of Jewish American Heritage Month. And the title of this lecture series is From Shtetl to Tinseltown, The Jewish Pioneers of uh, Hollywood. So we're gonna trace the uh, remarkable rise of the Jewish businessmen and entrepreneurs who made their way to um, the Golden State uh, way back in the uh, early 20th century and the important contribution they played as uh, pioneers of uh, Hollywood. I think you'll really enjoy this uh, lecture series because it really does um, examine the experience of, of entrepreneurial uh, Jews and their experience as uh, immigrants uh, or near immigrants uh, and in general um, how they assimilated into the uh, great tapestry uh, and were able to realize uh, the American dream. So this week's lecture is sort of a general overview of the early years of Hollywood, um, tracing how um, young Jewish businessmen um, who had plied various trades on the East Coast um, got involved in filmmaking and then uh, made their way to the West uh, and began um, a career as movie moguls during the uh, early years of uh, Tinseltown. So um, let's begin then with the birth of Tinseltown, the uh, founding fathers of Hollywood. So um, during the uh, last quarter of the uh, 19th century, there was a second wave of Jewish uh, immigration uh, to the United States. Primarily, these Jews um, came from uh, Eastern Europe and uh, Imperial Russia. Many of them came from the poor villages um, called uh, shtetls in uh, Yiddish. Many of them were in the Pale of Settlement. And these were the shtetls that were often uh, attacked by the um, Imperial troops of the Tsars. Um, these were the uh, towns in which uh, Jews suffered horribly during the uh, pogroms uh, launched against Jews. Now again, these were the second wave of Jews. So there had been a first wave of Jewish immigrants um, to the United States. These were primarily the Sephardic Jews that had come and settled in New Amsterdam, uh, later New York City. Uh, Sephardic Jews that had come uh, in the mid 17th century from uh, Recife, from Brazil. Uh, ultimately, they had originated from Portugal. So these were uh, Sephardim Jews. But as you know, the Jews that immigrated um, in the last quarter of the 19th were the Ashkenazi uh, Jews who spoke. Um, their vernacular uh, Yiddish, as opposed to the vernacular, the Sephardic or Ladino uh, Jewish. So um, they too um, were part of the uh, great um, immigration to the United States um, near the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And uh, they shared similar stories like uh, so many immigrants arriving um, on the shores of uh, America into an all new alien culture. And they had to learn how to assimilate 
to survive and begin life anew. But for the Jews, it was um, an even more difficult experience um, because um, they worshiped differently. Um, there was still widespread anti-Semitism in Europe and certainly there was uh, anti-Semitism that Jews would have to confront even uh, in the new world. So the uh, Jewish population um, in New York and the Eastern Corridor between uh, 1880 and 1920, this massive immigration of Jews from Eastern Europe and Imperial Russia was immense. Um, so in 1880, uh, the Jewish population in New York was something around 80 to 83,000, but by 1920, it had grown to well over one and a half million. And by 1924, um, there were over two million uh, Eastern European Jews who had emigrated to uh, the United States. And then we see um, migration to the West. Go West, young man. So we find um, many Jewish families uh, making their way from the East Coast Corridor, especially between uh, New York and uh, New Jersey, as well as the Midwest, making their way to the Golden State, this uh, new frontier on the uh, West Coast. And um, many of them um, had already uh, emigrated during the uh, gold rush uh, to San Francisco, but then in 1900, uh, many made their way to uh, the Los Angeles region. Beautiful climate, um, little if no uh, anti-Semitism to have to worry about, at least for the time being. So in 1900, um, there were roughly two and a half thousand Jews who had settled in Los Angeles County, but 20 years later, we already find um, distinctive neighborhoods um, in central Los Angeles, uh, and the growth had been uh, very sizable. So by a factor of nearly 35, 40. So by 1920, um, over 70,000, maybe 75,000 Jews living in Los Angeles. Now, many of them, of course, came for economic reasons, but a lot of them came due to health reasons. And um, very early on, um, uh, Jews, as they made their way up the ladder and were realizing the American dream, would go on to establish some of the most important hospitals, uh, medical institutions like Cedar sinai etc. Um, and that's why we find a cluster of great medical institutions um, in the L.A. area as a result of the largesse of these uh, early Jewish pioneers in uh, L.A. But many came um, for economic reasons, and uh, many Jewish families um, who would become synonymous with the early days of Hollywood uh, would settle in Los Angeles County. And of course, these included the uh, Gelbfishes or Goldfishes. Those were the Goldwins, so Sam Goldwin. The Myers, so Louis B. Uh, Mayer, the Cohens, Harry Cohen, and the Zuckers, uh, just to name some of the um, most famous and celebrated uh, Jewish families who would put their mark on um, early Hollywood. Here's a um, illustration of a Jewish couple arriving on the shores of America with um, Lady America right here. And here is a poster um, uh, encouraging uh, Jewish immigration. So the birth of Hollywood is um, inextricably linked with the um, arrival of many savvy uh, Jewish businessmen and filmmakers um, who made their way um, from the East Coast. Um, they, uh, many of them had been um, filmmakers in their own right, but as we'll discover in our subsequent lectures that will profile some of the uh, greatest 
filmmakers of early Hollywood, men like um, Louis B. Mayer and Adolf Zucker, um, many of them came from uh, professions um, that gave them the kind of business skill sets and acumen that could be translated to the um, very competitive uh, world of uh, Hollywood. Many of these uh, filmmakers, Jewish filmmakers from the East Coast, um, saw the potential of Thomas Edison's uh, famous uh, kin kinetoscope. So the um, kinetoscope, which had been um, invented more or less, I mean, uh, a lot of uh, discussion about who truly uh, invented sort of the forerunner of the uh, modern film pro projector, but we do know that uh, William Dixon and Tom Edison in 1891 took out a patent for the kinetoscope. And the way the kinetoscope operated is um, you would uh, run a, a reel of film between um, a lens and uh, an electric light bulb very quickly and then there was um, a little peephole through which the viewer could see the footage. So that was the kinetoscope, again, a kind of a rudimentary uh, film projector. But again, the Jewish filmmakers realized, my God, this has tremendous potential as a vehicle for creating truly great films, um, stories that could be trans post to film and would have wide appeal to Americans, um, middle class Americans in particular, but later lower class Americans who had um, limited funds to be able to enjoy the um, American pastime of uh, movie going. So um, one of the reasons why many of these filmmakers found it necessary to make their way west is because Thomas Edison, um, really the first early movie mo mogul, had um, charged excessive licensing fees to these filmmakers, and they were very expensive. But mostly he was suing these rivals when he thought they were encroaching on any of the patents that he had that involved filmmaking. And as you know, Edison had literally hundreds, if not thousands of uh, patents. So he re regarded a lot of these um, filmmakers as uh, pirates, especially the ones that lived in, around, in and around his um, headquarters in New Jersey, which was the home of the Edison Company, and is regarded in the history of filmmaking as sort of the original uh, movie capital. Many of these uh, Jewish filmmakers decided to leave the Eastern Corridor and make their way first to Cuba, where they were out of the jurisdiction for Edison to sue them. But eventually they made their way to that new frontier, the Golden State, California, and in particular to um, Los Angeles, um, City of Angels. So they were again away from Edison's um, onerous rules uh, surrounding his patents and of course the litigation of the um, Edison Mosin Picture Patents Company uh, located in New Jersey. So thus comes the start of what was called Hollywood Land. You see the famous Hollywood Land uh, sign. Um, this was erected in um, 1923 by um, an enterprising young man. It was only up for about a year and a half before it was pulled down, but Hollywood would later be um, abbreviated, shortened to Hollywood. And this um, area in Southern California, well, Southern California in general was like the ideal. It was an oasis, beautiful virgin country, plenty of sunshine uh, year round by the sea, had that classic Mediterranean sunshine. So these filmmakers quickly realized, my gosh, we could film 
all year round. We really didn't have inclement uh, weather. Um, moreover, um, the Hollywood Basin was um, just west of all sorts of different types of um, terrain. So as you know, once you move west, all sorts of eclectic ter terrain. Of course, um, you have to the west all those beautiful beaches, the seashore, beautiful sunshine. So it could um, um, be used sort of for maybe a European, Southern European location. Or if you went uh, farther west into the valley or into desert areas of Palm Springs and beyond, it could um, uh, be um, a uh, alternative for a desert location. But there were also the um, Alpine regions, there were uh, the Mount, you know, Mount Monument Valley, even uh, farther east. I think I made it, yeah, I have to get my directions. A lot of these locations were east of the LIA basin. Nonetheless, they realized the tremendous opportunities that they could enjoy good weather, incredible locations, uh, locales that could um, be used as exotic locations. So, so many of the great iconic westerns and um, some of the uh, great early silent film epics would be filmed on location, not only at the early film studios, um, which went up beginning in 1911, like this, the uh, Nestor Film Company, usually regarded as the first studio to open on Sunset Boulevard. And then a year later, um, no less than 15, maybe as many as 18 independent studios opened up um, to shoot films in and around um, Los Angeles. So it was the entrepreneurial Jewish immigrants or near immigrants who began on the East Coast, made their way to Hollywood and became the studio bosses who created the um, Hollywood studio system beginning um, in the early years of the 20th century and then exploded in the 1920s and 1930s with the uh, big five movie studios and the second steer of studios churning out some of the um, greatest films of all time during the so-called golden uh, age of Hollywood. So famous studios founded by um, these young Jewish um, filmmakers included Universal Studios, Paramount, Warner Brothers, Columbia, and others. Um, the men who established these uh, famous iconic studios are the names in the history books. Um, the, the men who played such a seminal role in the creation of Tinseltown. So Harry Cohen of Columbia Pictures, William Fox, um, born Wilmosch Fried, who went on to found Fox Pictures, which later merged with uh, 20th Century Fox. Of course, uh, Samuel Goldwyn, born Samuel Gelfish or Goldfish, uh, one of the founders of Goldwyn Pictures, later merging to become MGM, uh, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, along with Sam Goldwyn and uh, Louis B. Mayer, one of the founders of uh, MGM. And then there were the um, Von, Von Skolassers, uh, better known as the Warner Brothers, Jack and Harry Warner. And there were two other brothers as well who were involved in the film industry. And the legendary Adolf Zucker, Zucker um, who went on to found Paramount Studios. These are perhaps the most famous, but there were other very famous players who were so much a part of the studio system. Some of the uh, legendary pioneers of Hollywood, 
uh, who served as production managers and were the brains behind the um, movie machine. Individuals like uh, Irving Thalberg called the, uh, who's kind of the wunderkind, the wonder boy of Hollywood, famous uh, production manager um, at MGM. Um, and I think he actually started at Universal. Uh, Joseph Schneck, uh, the great David Selznick, um, who added the middle initial O, kind of an affectation. David O. Selznick, of course, famous for the Selznick uh, Studios and some of the greatest motion pictures of all time, like Gone with the Wind, uh, just to name a few. So this, these other uh, famous um, founders of Hollywood, Barney Balaban, Carl Lemley, et cetera, um, were the ones who made the important decisions, um, built the Hollywood uh, studio system and wielded tremendous power as regards what kind of films should be produced and uh, the price at which to market their films, uh, et cetera. And also the uh, all important decision of how they would be released, the order in which they would be released. Um, and a lot of the time, this was very strategic. So, um, you know, after World War I and between the two World War I, when films were actually released was um, of great importance. And, and they um, very much uh, influenced then, um, Again, what type of films were produced, when they were being made, uh, the budget for films, um, distribution, et cetera. And these films, of course, um, would have a tremendous, tremendous impact on the public imagination, um, shaping um, many of the opinions and uh, viewpoints of the uh, viewing, viewing audience um, at the time. Now, Hollywood was, for all intents and purposes, um, a company town, this um, rarefied world and one of the most beautiful areas of the world, this sort of rarefied, magical um, wonderland, if you will, very insular and um, didn't take very kindly um, to uh, outsiders, but interestingly enough, these immigrants or near immigrants, um, some only a generation removed from the shtetls of Poland and the Ukraine, were the ones who really uh, shaped um, the Hollywood imagination in the eyes of the public. They cultivated it. Um, and Many of these Jews were fiercely competitive, very savvy businessmen, but tremendous competition, especially among themselves. So although they came from, as it were, the same tribe, um, they shared the same faith, they um, were not necessarily very close with one another. There were epic rivalries, um, as you well know, among the uh, most famous uh, Jewish moguls during the 1920s and uh, 1930s. Um, and these um, company moguls um, cultivated this very upscale, exclusive community um, that was um, based upon some of their favorite pastimes like gambling um, in um, sporting events uh, or playing cards or betting on uh, the horses or even uh, their involvement um, in elections. Uh, they, their pastime and their life outside the studio, their leisure time, their recreational time, um, was preoccupied what, what many might consider, you know, their Jewish mothers might 
um, who wielded tremendous influence on, on them, looked, ex, looked askance um, with disapproval on what they deemed as sort of non-Jewish or un-Jewish activities. So again, being involved in gambling, race horse breeding and betting at like the famous Hollywood Park racetrack, which you um, see there again, was something that uh, Eastern Jew Jews were not necessarily involved in, but out West, um, this, these became among the uh, favorite pastimes, recreational pastimes of the uh, the famous uh, Jewish uh, moguls. So they tried very much to fit in and assimilate with um, their non-Jewish counterparts, um, the uh, wealthy wasps of, uh, of Los Angeles uh, and Hollywood. But they were still treated as outsiders because unfortunately, um, anti-Semitism um, did uh, lear its ugly head as the number of Jews making their way to uh, Southern uh, California uh, incre increased. Um, so they were uh, discriminated uh, from the elite uh, social clubs like the uh, famed uh, Wilshire Club uh, in Beverly Hills. So because they were barred, uh, excluded from these rarefied uh, social gatherings, they realized they would have to establish um, their own clubs where they could mingle and conduct uh, business as it uh, related to Hollywood. So in 1920, uh, a number of prominent Hollywood executives, as well as um, prominent uh, members of the Jewish community, um, bankers, lawyers, doctors, um, came together and invested their money to open up the Hillcrest Country Club, which was um, located on Pico Boulevard and conveniently located uh, just opposite Fox Studio. So this became um, kind of a watering hole for the Jewish moguls, a kind of sanctuary of Jewishness um, for like members. Here's, here's a, a color um, photo of how the Hillcrest Club looks today, still a, quite a opulent upscale um, establishment. So what it, did it mean to be Jewish or specifically how would one define Jewishness, if you will, um, in Hollywood? Well, as far as the Jewish um, moguls um, were concerned, it didn't have so much to do with Judaism or necessarily your nationality as someone who was Jewish, it had more to do with being a member of the tribe, if you will. That kinship that Jews, whether they were Sephardic or Ashkenazic Jews, they were all member of the tribe. So Jewishness was based more on loyalty to the tribe, that kind of kinship that clannishness, um, if you will. Now, it is true that most of these Jews, if you trace their, their ancestry back to their arrival in the New World, um, many of these young Jewish boys, uh, now many of them now were middle-aged, um, began as um, quite observant Jews in their homes. So they would regularly go to the temple, uh, be part of um, the Seder, be part of the Shabbat, take part and celebrate uh, Rosh Hashanah, um, Yom Kippur, Sukkot Purim, all the uh, great Jewish 
holidays, but that wasn't so much the case um, when they settled in Hollywood. Now it's true that a lot of them knew some Hebrew, they went to Hebrew school. They certainly uh, knew a good deal of uh, Yiddish. They had taken part early on in Jewish rituals, in particular, the all important bar mitzvah, that transition from childhood to manhood, so important to a young man. But when they finally reached um, adulthood, they wanted more than anything else to assimilate into American culture. So you see them more and more shadowing, sh uh, shedding, sh I'm sorry, shedding a lot of their outward Jewishness, even changing, kind of anglicizing their Jewish surnames. Uh, a lot of this happened when their families first settled in the New World, but in Hollywood, that process uh, would continue. As you see in many um, celebrated, not only Jewish moguls, but uh, many of the legendary Jewish actors um, changed their Jewish sounding surnames and uh, anglicized them. Um, as you uh, well know, you know, individuals like uh, Kirk Douglas, Edward G. Uh, Robertson, Douglas uh, Fairbanks, uh, Ed Wynn, just to name a few. A lot of these, um, many Hollywood moviegoers never thought were uh, of Jewish extraction, but those um, Anglo-Saxon names suggested something else altogether. So, for many of these Jews of Hollywood, uh, Jewish expression, what it was to be a Jew was often um, sort of milk, uh, a lukewarm, passive. Yes, you know, as one would expect uh, within, when they were in the company of one another, kvitching, et cetera, family events or doing business transaction, they were always throwing around, um, choice Yiddish words. Most of them belong to the temple. They paid their annual dues, especially to the, perhaps the most famous temple in LA, uh, the Wilshire Boulevard temple that you see here. But men like Harry Cohen and Louis B. Mayer, for all the world, even though in their youth, they um, practice Orthodox rituals, at their synagogues, they rarely went to temple. Just maybe on the important uh, holy days, they would make uh, an appearance. Um, semi, many really, in many ways, tried to efface or wa whitewash their Jewish identity altogether. That was certainly true with David Selznick, again, this affectation with adding a, a middle initial of O that didn't stand for anything, he would tell reporters, I'm an American, not a Jew. Um, Harry Cohen, founder of Columbia that you see um, in the upper right hand corner here, um, when he was uh, buried in 1958, um, it wasn't a Jewish uh, funeral with all the beautiful ritual and prayers from the uh, Old Testament that we're familiar with. Instead, it was a non-denominational funeral. There was no mention that he had been born Jewish. So the Jewish boys of Hollywood, more than anything else, even though many of them began, as we'll see in our next three lectures, were born in the old world, were born in the shtetls of Poland. Some came from cities like uh, Warsaw, others came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, some came from Imperial Russia. Once they arrived and had assimilated, they wanted to be seen as 100% um, all American. And, and yet, um, there, 
immigration experience really informed the way not only they made movies, but the kind of movies they made. So how the American public would view these movies, experience these movies, was really through the lens of these Jewish immigrants. So um, their passion, their love, their enthousi enthusiasm for being 100% American was translated onto the film. And oftentimes it was very, very idolized, um, very much removed from some of their, the tragic backgrounds of their ancestors uh, recently arrived on American shores. They very much created a romanticized, often Id idealized image of how they wanted viewers to view the American experience. But again, through the lens of an immigrant, it was very self-selective. It championed the great American values and virtues of the American experiment and ultimately embraced the American dream of which, of which they had realized. So many of these movie moguls, again, um, recent immigrants or first generation um, Jewish boys, believe they had that sort of special kind of instinct or sixth sense about what it was to be um, an immigrant. And again, they translated that onto the screen. So what they presented in films was how they wanted Americans to view American culture. And again, it was based upon um, their journey and their eventual success and the realizing of the American dream. Now, early on, uh, many of these studios would produce signature style films, if you will. Um, that's not so true today, but, um, you know, some of the uh, more recent incarnations of film studios have their signature style, but it was certainly true in the golden age of Hollywood. So MGM became noted for producing kind of saccharine, um, kind of folksy, if you will, Mon Pa Kettle, you know, um, films that were sometimes romantic, overly sentimental. These appealed to um, middle American women. They were feminine, if you will. So there were scores and scores of films that um, appealed to middle, middle America, and especially a lot of Americans who lived on the farms. Uh, films that were populated with the type of figures that they would come across in their in small town, town America. Now Warner Brothers on the other hand was known for its grittier films, uh, a lot of their crime stories, um, film noir, melodramas, many uh, social socially conscious that were less ladylike as they were described and the kind of films that appealed to the hard, gritty working class. And um, many of these films featured as their protagonists, um, you know, um, very sort of iconic working um, class uh, figures. And uh, many of the actors um, themselves of Jewish extraction, um, transformed themselves as we see into sort of these gritty working class men who um, labored in uh, factories and uh, 
the kind of jobs we associate with the lower working classes. So each of these studios um, produced their own kinds of films that were identifiable. Again, kind of signature films that we associate with individual um, movie studios. But nonetheless, um, their themes of, Ameri of American popular culture were once again seen through the lens of these Jewish immigrants. So that's just a sort of a brief uh, survey of uh, early Hollywood. We'll return to um, this important critical period in Hollywood history um, again next week and then the subsequent weeks of this short lecture series as we um, discuss um, some of the legendary uh, movie moguls. So next week, uh, Louis, B. Mayer, B. Louis B. Mayer. After that, um, Adolf Zucker, who coined the phrase, remember, the public is never wrong. He, the founder of Paramount Studios. And um, week four in the month of May, again, in honor of Jewish American Heritage Month, um, the famous uh, Warner Brothers, um, where some of Hollywood's greatest films, where uh, Betty Davis spent many years um, starring in some of her uh, iconic roles. So uh, thank you for joining me this week. Um, look forward to seeing you again. Again, I'm sorry I'm not able to be with you in person, but um, I will be with you once again um, when June uh, rolls around. So see you next uh, week and take care for now.